Meditations with Ryan Slomack. Welcome to 2024. It's only been a few days, and uh, I'm honored that we get to spend some time together. I hope that you're reflecting on the 2023 you and saying, you know, that person was awesome, but I think 2024 is my jam. I know there's a whole bunch of memes out there saying, eh, don't do that, it's dangerous, but I think optimistic thinking does have its benefits. So I hope you're stepping into this uh, this new rotation around the sun with a lot of optimism and excitement. And you get to listen to a new episode of Meditations with Ryan's Lomax. so what's not to love? On this show, we spend time uh, just making space for conversation with interesting people, and today's guest is awesome. So we're going to talk with Kyla Yeager, who is a Canadian-based artist. She describes herself as an ADHD intuitive artist, so somebody who uses her ADHD powers, the uh, neurodivergent spectrum that she's on, uh, just to uh, sort of embrace the way her mind works to make art from it. And this holds a special place in my heart because I was diagnosed with ADD when I was in third grade, and I learned pretty early on that like my attention span, my inability to tune out stimuli uh, was different than other people's. And I've spent a very, very long time focusing on breathing techniques, organizational techniques, successes and failures just to figure out what my best path forward is. And it's really cool to spend some time talking with somebody who has made an entire art career out of embracing uh, the cognitive shifts that happen in our minds when uh, we have a brain that is affected by ADHD. So without further ado, we are going to transport north to uh, the big city of Toronto, Canada to speak with Kyla Yeager. Kyla, I really appreciate you being on the show. Um, and you're beaming in all the way from Canada. It's like so far away from New York State. Like I, it's you're in a whole other world. What's going on in Canada right now? What's going on in Canada? It's getting colder. Uh, and there's it's holiday market season right now, actually. So I've been doing so many art markets over and over again. I'm on autopilot that I, I thrive in that scenario. So I've been having a good time. That's awesome. I feel like, is there a, a poutine vendor at every art market? Is that like legally required? Well, poutine's mostly a Quebec thing. So if you get poutine in Ontario, it's probably not that good. So. All right. <laughs> but so at least we've... that's what all the people from Quebec say. <laughs> Love it. We've already demonstrated my ignorance. Like right at the beginning <laughs> of the show, this is the way to go. Um, so Kyla, I find you really interesting because you, uh, you, you started off in New Orleans and then eventually made your way to... Uh, to Canada for for school and to sort of start your career. What was it like growing up in New Orleans? It was fun. Uh, I mean, everyone says, oh, you must have been like partying all the time and all this stuff. But that's my home. That's where I was born and raised. So it's just kind of like the norm for me. Um, But it was really fun being immersed in so much culture and creativity, not just like visual arts and music. And I was also like a theater kid. So just being around so much bright, vibrant cultural energy, I think had a huge influence on like my career path as an adult for sure. But I had fun, although like Katrina happened when I was in grade five. Uh, It's crazy how my language has changed. You say fifth grade in the States and grade five in Canada. So depending on who I'm talking to, like my vocabulary sometimes changes. I love Uh, it. Yeah. How did, I mean, that's a, I had gone, I had gone to New Orleans for the first time right after Hurricane Katrina. Um, And just, I, I, a part of me has, has always just been so upset that I never got to see that town uh, prior to that catastrophe. Like as a, as a fifth grader, like how did that experience impact you? I mean, I was incredibly privileged. I call it my city strategy, not my personal tragedy, because I was in the lucky 20% of the city that did not get flooded during the storm. So our house did not did not get destroyed, but pretty much all of my friends did and my school and everything. So uh, before the storm, it was just New Orleans. But after the storm, I think because everybody had such a consistent tragedy, like throughout the city, um, everybody got a lot closer there's just so much more friendliness and community, I feel like personally, Um, because when you go through something together, it kind of changes you. But uh, I definitely, you know, in my head in grade five, my mom and I were actually training for a triathlon and it was supposed to be the day before the storm and it got canceled. I remember all my 10 year old self could think of was like, 
this is like horrible. This isn't even a real store. Like I was just so upset. And then we evacuated to Knoxville, Tennessee, and we lived in the middle of like, I don't know, we lived with like a bunch of random people. We lived underneath a highway for a while. And it was really strange. Like this house, I'm pretty sure was haunted. Um, but sorry, my earphone fell out my ear. Uh, I'm going on a tangent now, but I went to a Montessori school in the middle of a forest called Nature's Way. And it was really fun. <laughs> Fascinating. And then four months later, back in New Orleans and then back to normal. So. Yeah, it isn't. I always like tell people that I think that like my most traumatic experience was like moving when I was in seventh grade. And like, I really do think that like that had that such a just traumatic, just like identity changing part of my life. And I can't imagine you know, like watching an entire place that you call home just change overnight. Um, and on top of that, you have to just vacate from it for such a long period of time, uh, especially when you're in the middle of like your most important developmental years. Yeah, it's actually interesting because uh, I don't, we haven't touched on it yet, but my one of my first ADHD or I guess I went to a psychologist to get testing done because I was bad in school and that was right before the storm. And so I don't even know if the results like sort of came through even before the evacuation and everything. Read back on those files like during COVID, I found the the file in my mom's house and I read it. That was interesting. <laughs> well, let's talk about that a little bit then. So you, you know, right now you're uh you know you're 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 known on TikTok and you're known on Instagram and you're known in the art world as this intuitive ADHD artist but obviously that had to come from somewhere right um how did you like well first of all i i just you know i i talk about this in the introduction a little bit but like i have ADD uh which you know at the time that i was diagnosed like ADD and ADHD were two different things and now the DSM has wrapped them together as as one definition um but how did you like discover that you had um, you had ADHD and how did like having that definition applied to you change your perspective moving forward? Yeah, so I actually didn't have an official diagnosis until I was 17. So in 2012. And it was really tough because I went through the majority of my childhood. Like pretty much thinking I was stupid because I was so bad in school. I like didn't know why I did all the homework. I did all the readings, but I couldn't retain anything. I just didn't get why nobody trusted me. None of my teachers, my parents didn't trust me. And until that diagnosis, it was like, suddenly everybody was like, Oh, that makes sense. And I've been like, this is what I've been telling you the whole time. And uh, I think it's really hard too, because, you know, especially in young women, especially in girls, you're masking your personality to adhere to societal standards, to adhere to maybe abusive people around you and to be pretending like you're someone that you're not for 17 years is really tough. So once I <laughs> got that diagnosis, well, not only did my personality finally come out, but my art exploded. Like, I used to do realism for most of my childhood. Like I would just draw like still lives and portraits and landscapes. And once I got that diagnosis, like the abstract just kind of like came out of nowhere. It was really random and really weird and really awesome. And what do you think the linchpin for that was? I mean, do you think it was the actual like uh, the 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 application of the um the term do you think it was the like the society like th your own personal relationships changing around you do you think it was uh like the way in which you approached your work after that or, or any, any sort of medication like what what do you think like spurred that like complete shift well a couple of things happened uh so in my junior year of high school i basically had three panic attack meltdowns in the same month. One of them wasn't even in the middle of a soccer game. I also play soccer. Um, and it came to the point where I was just like, mom, like something is up. Like I need to go get tested again. I was put on, on Vyvanse. I was put on medication and I've been on the same medication on a low dose since high school and I'm 29 now. So, uh, that definitely made a difference. It was suddenly my grades went from C's to A's because I could actually focus in class. Uh, you know, my art style changed. I didn't adhere to like what art teachers wanted and doing just 
things in a way that I was taught. I was doing things in a way that I wanted to. Uh, I took all of the doodles that I was making in the side of my notes and I made them big, giant, abstract paintings. And sort of just taking that masking and that hiding of who I was and putting it under a magnifying glass for the entire world to see. And now I use that as a driving point in my art career because I think that that's probably one of the most special things about me is my neurodivergence. And I don't think I would be as successful in my art career without it. Interesting. I love that idea of like, uh, I don't know, we often say that like what you really should be doing is what you do when you procrastinate. And like the fact that you, you're you in school and you're like doodling your notebook on the side and then all of a sudden you're feeling empowered to like bring those doodles and it, it just like helps accentuate and like helps you discover your next sort of like artistic phase. Like I just, I just love the fact that it was literally hiding in the margins of a notebook. Yeah. And it's funny because my senior like show in high school, we like I was in the art program and we all had a, a, a gallery show and it was called Marginal Boredom. And it was basically all of the margins of my pages from like not the physical pages, but the pieces represented that. And then I made like a giant wall mural of like a bunch of triangles. And it was cool. It's super fun. Uh, one of my favorite artists he's gotten mentioned on the show before is uh, Sergio Aragones, who uh, is known for his marginals, which are little comics that are like hidden on the side of pages in Mad Magazine. It's just such an underappreciated art medium. Like the things that happen that we we if we move away from base content, we can we can discover. I uh, it you know I one of the things I wanted to ask you is is sort of a strange question, but like. How do you describe having ADHD to somebody? Because I think that like I'm normally, you know, there's in in society, like there's this, there's this, there's this been the shift over the last decade where like there's a lot more diagnoses, but there's also a lot more people who are discovering their own attention issues and assuming that it's ADHD. And just the fact that like my mind's distracted, I don't think is is what makes it. That it, what makes ADD or ADHD that? And I'm curious how you describe it to people when you say like, as somebody with ADHD, this is what it's like. So imagine, you know, on the radio when like they, you can have it shift from, from a uh, station to station automatically. What is that called? Like seek or something like that. Like yeah. it shifts from station to station. Imagine that's happening seven times at the same time. And each time in both years, there's having different stations go on over and over and over again. And it doesn't, sometimes it can be a little bit muted down with medication. Sometimes it can be a little bit muted down if you're in your hyper-focused like trance state, whether it's art, music, whatever is your passion. But for the most part, you're walking down the street, you're thinking about 17 didn't think at the same time and not knowing if the fact that you have to go to the bathroom a little bit or if you have to send an important email is like, those can be the same level of importance. Like there's no level of like, this is priority. This is not priority. And when you're a student in school, that can be very, very difficult to um, work around. So I think making the decision to be my own boss uh, and then having people in my life in place to sort of like check in with me and make sure that I'm doing what I need to do is the system that actually works for my ADHD. When I work for other people, it is like a a fun time. <laughs> totally. I always I always describe uh, you know, having ADD as as um an inability to tune out stimuli. Like there's at any given moment, there's like so many things going on. I mean, I'm just looking at your, you know, like studio right now and there's like 17 different paintings and there's like, as I'm talking to you, I'm like looking at you and then all of a sudden trying to figure out what logic you put together when you organized your paints. Um, and like, there's just an inability to tune that out. And the the way to move past it is to develop all of these strategies. Sometimes it's medication, sometimes it's um, you know, focusing on on our own bodies and learning how our own bodies function. Sometimes it's help, as you mentioned, having other people check in with us and having those sort of like points of contact. When you were and when you were diagnosed, I'm curious. Like, it sounds like you had a really awesome and significant shift in a very short period of time. Other than medication, what were the other sort of like changes that made it so your executive functioning and your focus could uh, could be relied upon more? 
Well, I could definitely say that there's a shift in like my lifestyle between like the teenage years, uh, my early 20s, my late 20s. Uh, but I think it's keeping myself busy, keeping myself socially motivated. I, like, I'm a socially motivated person naturally. Like if someone's relying on me to be somewhere or do something, I will set everything else aside. I'm a people pleaser. So that's just kind of, I th- it's an ADHD trait, but it's also just like a Kyla trait. Um, but when I'm doing something to make someone happy or doing something to make sure someone finds success, I will put my heart and soul into it. And that's why it's toxic for me to work for other people because I'll put like 150% of my energy into that job and then put nothing into my self-care or my, or my like passions. So, um, yeah, being able, I know that also movement and exercise helps, but I'm in the current moment, really bad at coming up with a plan. (laughs) Like I'm lucky if I do a few stretches for five minutes. Uh, but I think that's because I am an artist and I work from home and I feel like if I do anything else than work on my business or on my mental health, then I'm taking away from whatever I'm working on. But I know that I need to get some sort of exercise plan in place sometime soon. Playing soccer once a week, once, one season a year is not going to cut it. So um, I'll get there. Maybe if you interview someone that does like fitness or whatever, I'll, I'll tune in very closely. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hone in on some personal trainers just for you, Kyla. We'll make sure we get them <laughs> on the you. podcast. Uh, so I, I want to stay, I want to stay back in history a little bit and then we'll, we'll come to sort of what you're doing now, um, which is, you know, you discover yourself as an artist uh, and uh, you discover yourself as just a more a motivated l- or, or, or how do, I don't want to say more sustainable learner. I think maybe that's the term that I want to use. Um, and then you decide to venture to uh, York University uh, for uh, for education program. Had you always planned to study art? And like, what what was the appeal of studying art at uh, in in higher education? So if I was going to go do my undergrad, it was going to be in art or something art related because I knew for a fact, I would not have the focus for anything else or the care. And I still to this day believe that if you're going to go to school and you're not passionate about whatever you're studying, it's going to be a waste of time because then you're going to hate your job for the rest of your life. (laughs) So, uh, I actually, one of the programs that I did apply to that wasn't necessarily specifically an art program. I, I applied to Syracuse university for their, like, uh, what was it? Some kind of digital, no, it was like Mark advertising, something like that. I actually forgot the name of the program. Was it, was it new house? Is there something like that? It it was like design. It was definitely something having to do with design, but I'm really glad I didn't because I hate screens. Although now I'm getting into procreate, but that's another story. I'm sorry. I go off on tangents nonstop. I'm trying to control it, but you know, I'm unmasked and I can't go back. (laughs) <laughs> you're good. So, so in regards to, uh, you know, shout out to Syracuse University, you're five minutes down the road right now. Um, but in regards to you finding a program that you were passionate about at York, what, what about their program really spoke to you? And just what did you want to get out of that program, you know, when you were going to go? Well, my mom's Canadian, so I have dual citizenship. So I was able to have the opportunity to pay tuition that was like, the Canadian tuition, which is much cheaper. My parents were like, you're either going to go to Louisiana or Canada, which one? Um, so I chose York because it had a the best art par- program out of all the schools that I applied to. And I had never visited it before. I just kind of picked one. And it wasn't like, I, I didn't apply to OCAD, Ontario College of Art and Design, because it didn't have on-campus residency and coming by myself to a new country. I wanted to make sure I had that like, those support systems in place from like the university setting of like on-campus residency and meal plans and all that stuff, not just like an apartment downtown Toronto by myself. So I did that and I got involved in a lot of extracurriculars. Like I did intramural soccer. I was also in a sorority and I was also president of a sorority. I do not seem like a sorority girl. I don't even know why I was in it, but you know, it was good for like, I like leadership skills and opportunity type things. So um, in event planning, that is like a, a side fun thing that I like to do. <laughs> but uh, I thought that the art program was good, but in no way did it prepare me for being an artist. Artists taught me how to be an artist, being in shows with other artists. So 
that was interesting. But I did learn a lot about art history and different kinds of art styles. Got a lot of studio time in. Uh, I'm glad I went because people definitely took me more seriously with a BFA. <laughs> so. Yeah, fair enough. Um, in regards to like just connecting with it, I mean, you describe yourself, your art as abstract, psychedelic art, cubism, a mixture of, sorry, abstract, psychedelic art, cubism, and surrealism. Like, is that, are those terms or are those ideas that you picked up in college or were those things that had just sort of like made their way to you? Well, my style has grown into what it is now. And that's how I describe it at its current moment. But I used to call it, uh, psychedelic subconscious like pre-covid because i would use my subconscious and it looked psychedelic and then before that i didn't really have a category for my art because i did some abstract pieces some realism and i just kind of like when i was an undergrad i just did assignment and that's the thing about when you go to art school is that the majority of your art program is what they call assignmenty it's two assignmenty so if you submit it to an art show you probably won't get in because it looks like an assignment but after leaving art school was when I really found my voice. But during COVID is when I found my signature style. So that's what it is today. And I call it intuitive ADHD art. Awesome. So, um, you know, in regards to that, like, uh, I want to, you know, obviously this is an auditory podcast, uh, you know, and I'm sure everybody's on their phones right now, uh, Googling Kyla Yeager art to, to see what's on there. But like, how do you describe your art to somebody who's never seen it before? Like what, what words, like, obviously we have those terms, but like, how, give me some sort of visual descriptions and your art's tactile too, which I think is really interesting. Um, give me some, give me some descriptions. Well, I can talk about my process a little bit and then that can help to understand what it looks like. So that, that sounds great. Uh, my process begins by playing with the medium, playing with paint, whether it be starting with like a scribbly line or a blob of paint or like using a sponge, whatever materials I have around. I use whatever comes in that play moment. And then I find images in the paint as I do, like looking at the clouds, finding shapes, that's kind of thing. So if I see like an eyeball or a mouth or a nose or a face, also backstory, used to love portraiture, did portraiture all the time. And I think that's why facial organs tend to emerge within my art. But also my art is very emotional and based on my current headspace mind state. So what is the best way to portray emotions through facial organs? So a lot of times people ask me, why do you have so many eyeballs in your art? And my answer is, I, the eyes can be seen in two different ways. They can either be seen as eyes of empathy or eyes of judgment, depending on how you look at it. So you can look at a neurodivergent person and either empathize with them and try to learn and understand the situation, or you can just judge them and continue wanting them to mask around you and not support them in any way. And so that's the difference between someone who like likes my art and follows my art and someone who doesn't. And, uh, I don't know. I just, I like to open that door and have everyone see the eyes of empathy so that when they do see my work, it either resonates with them or it connects with them in a way that they, they have like an ADHD family member or a friend and they start to understand it a bit more like, oh, this is what it must feel like to have your mind going a mile a minute all the time. So it's very colorful, hyper detailed, psychedelic, uh, discombobulated faces and organs and random items that might flow into my subconscious while I'm painting and uh, hyper detailed so much that every time you look at it, you'll see something different depending on your perspective. Yeah. And let's go back to process real quick. So you talked about, you start off with kind of that spirit of play and that play brings out, um, you know, some, some descriptors of the headspace that you're in, but also uh, you're, you're kind of like an archeologist. You're kind of like seeking out images within the play that, um, that sort of stand out to you? What do you do after you sort of like recognize that that imagery or those patterns or the things that you want to put in there? Yeah, so if I see something, I will add it in and be like, oh, that's a mouth. I add the mouth. Um, and then as I go, it's all about general to specific. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that term general to specific. You learned it in art school. It's when you start a little bit loose in general with your lines and with your details, and then you get really specific to the details. So you don't really see too, sometimes you see it on TikTok and I don't know how people paint that way where they do like all of the details of a face 
in each little portion and then go from there. But really like the way that most artists are taught to paint is by starting with like a circle and then like you do lines where the eyes would be and the mouth would be. And then you do, you know, it, and then you do the details at the last level of the painting process. So that's how I flow through. And I think that's probably because of my realism background, why it works that way. But um, when it's finished, it's not about, is, it used to be about, is there enough detail on the entire thing that I can't do anymore? But now it's just a feeling. And usually it is just jam packed to the brim with details. But um, that feeling is sort of like, well, that's the current headspace. So. Yeah, you've described yeah. you've described looking at your artwork as like a surrealist where's Waldo activity, right? Like Yeah. Uh, yeah, the ADHD where's Waldo is like how I like to play it cuz then, you know, someone who collects my art who has ADHD, they have it on their wall at home. And then instead of like that aimless stare at a blank white wall, they stare at one of my paintings and then one of the random things in the painting might remind them to do something that they forgot to do, who knows. Uh, but also it gives them a safe place to unmask in a safe space, um, which I find is very important because not everyone can unmask at home. Sometimes people have family members that are abusive or don't allow a safe space to be themselves. So I want my art to encourage people. Yes, you can just be you and nobody else matters. Like it just do your thing. So I want to come back to this masking comment later, but I'm, I want to finish this process thing for, for a number of your pieces, you have this three dimensional tactile component to that process. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you add that layer? How do you determine that these are the places where I want people to touch the artwork, where I want someone to fidget with it? Like, uh, how do you determine which pieces will be things that you want people to actually physically touch versus, uh, take a step back and sort of look at? So most of my larger scale works are just the visually stimulating pieces. And my smaller scale works are, uh, I, I usually have a sign on my market tables or my show tables, like this is art you can touch or a sign that says fidget fine art. So fidget fine art is, I call it like the, it's a fidget toy of the fine art world. And they do, other people in the world, like they do make uh, tactile art, but not in my exact style. And I tend to use hot glue uh, for the, those, uh, those ridges. Uh, hot glue is really hard to work with. Only a certain amount comes out of the thing at, at a time. It's very hot and you could burn yourself. And then there's that stringiness that comes at the end of the hot glue that can be very annoying and look like literally a piece of hair. And then you can get hair stuck in it too. Um, but I like it because it forces me to focus so hard. It's better than any ADHD medication that anyone can take because I, I, I can't hurt myself. Um, there's only so much that comes out at a time. You have to sort of like pre-plan where your line's going to go because it's only going to go so far. And it's like testing myself. And I know I could easily use like polymer clay or, or a different sculpting medium to do these things, but I choose to do it the hard way because it's, it's more stimulating for my brain and it's satisfying to use. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> My mind is blown because like having having spent the last few days just like looking at your artwork and looking at people interact with your artwork and like understanding like, all right, here's how this sort of uh, fidget fine art thing functions. I would have never in a million years known that was hot glue. I mean, just, you know, for listeners at home, like picture, you know, uh, a piece of artwork that is maybe uh, like the, the width and uh, length of a brick. And is maybe like a two by four or not a two by four, but like maybe, maybe like a small book in, in depth. And then you've got all this sort of like, uh, I don't know, interesting, like guiding lines that are, that are curved and all over the place with really interesting, vibrant colors. And then these just like really pretty little dots that are making their way, uh, around the piece that are like a very, um, potent color. Uh, and they, they look like, uh, this is a horrible analogy, but like little boils that have made their way that like, and I use that analogy, not in the way that they're gross, but in the sense that they are completely immersed into the piece. And knowing that that's a hot glue like component is just baffling to me. Cause as I was looking at it, I was just thinking like, okay, cool. Is this like, is this paint that's, that's mixed with, uh, you know, like some, some adhesive that kind of goes over and lays on top of it. But to know that like every single one of those little circles has to be so carefully, uh, managed to ensure that like, it's, it's going to perfectly bubble over and look like it's part of the piece is just a fascinating insight into your creative process. Mm -hmm. It also helps that I don't really believe in mistakes 
uh, that helps with my process a lot. Um, I know that um, the Bob Ross happy accidents thing is like very trendy, but it's a reality within my practice. If I am unhappy with the way that I've made a certain part of my piece, number one, you can go over it with something else. Number two, you can go with it and flow with it and let it be an opportunity for a new direction. Um, I really hate it when artists are really down on themselves for making a mistake. And this is also part of the reason I don't do a lot of realism anymore because I don't think art should have a right or wrong answer. I think art should be like, I'm no art therapist, but art definitely is my therapy. And uh, I just, especially when I teach intuitive art classes to people as well, I teach people how to let go of that perfectionism aspect, but also even by viewing my art, if you're not an artist, you can learn how to let go of the perfectionism of even composition of art has to look a certain way. I break a ton of rules in the fine art world and I've gotten like declined for many opportunities, but I've also gotten accepted for opportunities as well. And my art is very niche and only certain people are into it, but it makes me feel good. So I'm going to keep doing it. Well, let's talk about you as a, uh, a business owner. Right. So you're, uh, you get out of college and it's, you know, like I'm amazed Kyla, at, like the amount of like cool galleries you've been a part of and like the different collaborations that you've, you know, you've been in. And I, I just love the fact that like all of your, all of your work focuses on ensuring that there is, there is an empathetic nature to the way in which your art is hung and displayed. Like it's, you're, you're going into these place, places unapologetically saying that like, I want people to connect with my art, not necessarily because they like it, but because it serves a purpose and can calm the right people down who need that calming. Like, I just think that's really neat. Um, how did you decide out of college? So, you know, you realized early on, early on that you weren't going to work for other people, but tell me about that transition from like getting out of college and just saying, you know what, like I am going to be my own boss and I'm going to make this work. Yeah. So, uh, I did five years of undergrad in my, in my fifth year. Well, one thing with neurodivergence, if you need, if you're listening and you're in undergrad or school or anything, you need to take more time to do your degree, do it because you're going to stress yourself out. So I did five years of my undergrad and my fifth year, I was part-time and I was also president of a sorority. And I learned that I did not like being in charge of something that I did not create as much as I was like the one in charge, it, everyone's got an opinion, but if I'm the one in charge of it, then I don't need people's opinions going down my throat. It's just me. Um, so right out of college, I actually joined, a service corps. I moved to Washington, DC, and I did a, a Jewish social justice service corps thing where I had intentional communal living with like 24 people on a compound. And we all worked full time for nonprofits. I worked for a nonprofit called DC scores. And it was basically an after school program for kids uh, through soccer, poetry and service learning. So I actually taught poetry and we won third place in our poetry slam. So that was really fun. And I learned I loved working with kids and, and I had always, always been a soccer coach in the summers. Um, but it was really cool because my love for soccer and my love for the arts were intertwined into a nonprofit that I worked for full time. But that job was only a year contract and it was sort of like a one time thing. So after that, I moved back to New Orleans, moved in with my mom so I could afford to travel. And then I did like a four week backpacking solo trip in Europe, uh, fall 2019. And right before and when I got back, I started working as a substitute teacher. I just had to think about my vocabulary. I was about to say supply teacher because they call it that in Canada, <laughs> but substitute teacher at my old high school uh, slash middle school slash elementary school. And what I did was I would bring small canvases, my paint pens, and I would basically sit at the teacher's desk and work on my art while the kids did their work. And it was a lovely thing because then I started vending my art in the evenings at art markets. Uh, but before that, I was working for another artist and I learned while working for that artist that I need to work for myself. So I learned what I needed to learn from that artist and I started vending for myself. So January 2020 was when I launched Kylie Yeager artwork and started actively selling my art. I, I had like my first shows like in 2017, 2018, but they were like very impromptu artist run little market shows in Toronto. and. Um, I wouldn't consider myself to have been like any kind of established at that point. So January, 2020 was when I really had my branding down. 
And then March 2020 came around. Uh, I remember it was March 13th and we got the announcement that school would be closed. So I was substitute teaching that day and I was on my computer and I have never made and like built a website so quickly in my life. So I made a website for my art and everything and started doing it online. And then a few months later, I made a TikTok, started being more active on Instagram. And then suddenly my art business, you know, as much as I thought I was finding success by selling it in person markets and that shut down, it forced me to like take it virtual. And I don't know where I would be if I didn't set up all that then. So that's how, and then, and then COVID happened and then the style and then here I am. <laughs> a lot of other stuff happened, but that's the summary. That's awesome. Um, what, like, so what, what does the life of an artist look like for you, you know, in general? I mean, obviously, uh, you spend most of your time just thinking about how cool it would be on the Meditations with Ryan Zlomick podcast. But other than that, now that that dream is passed, uh, like, what, what does the daily life of, of Kyla look like in regards to, uh, you know, balancing the executive needs of and the administrative needs of your business and making sure that you're, you're doing pop-up shows and selling online and, and building work? Like, how does that, how does that work on a, on a daily or weekly schedule? So obviously in the last few years, it changes from day to day. I've had day jobs during times, especially during COVID when people were not buying art. I worked in a daycare for a little while. And then after I had that work scenario, I was like trying to be a full-time artist, but I didn't trust that I can make money full-time. So I started taking uh, like 14 shifts a week from the soccer or coaching soccer for the company I worked for. And then I was asked to be the art program leader for this company that I worked for. It was an extracurricular company. And while it seemed like everything that I needed to be a full-time artist, working a creative full-time job as an artist is actually probably one of the worst things that you can do because it'll suck away all of your creative energy into somebody else's passion, not your own. So I was both a full-time artist and a full-time employee of this company. And I was overworking myself. I had no social life, no love life. Still don't much have much of a love life or social life, but it's okay. I'm dating my art career. I've completely, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with that though. Like, I think that if I do want to find success and fame and all the things that I want out of my art career, I have to put my everything into it. And I'm okay with that. I live alone. There's not like anyone I'm neglecting. So, uh, but yeah, day to day, I wake up. I actually, in the past month or so, I so I, I have a therapist. It's very important to have a therapist when you're an artist because stuff can go down. But um, I started making, I know that the people can't see it, an ADHD daily menu. And I was doing so many different to-do lists where I couldn't keep track of everything. There are so many pieces of paper around my house, but instead I have my must do's, my get it done and my finish it. And my must do's are in the morning. My middays are the get it done's. And then my finish it's are in the evenings. And I write down all the important stuff. And if I don't finish something, then it stays on the list for the next day. And it's all laminated and I do it with a dry erase marker. So it feels really good to check things off and erase things. And instead of like, crossing it out on a to-do list that I will forget exists in two hours. Um, and then I also have like my feel goods, my want to do's and my self cares. And if I put my self care on my calendar, then or on, on my menu, what is saying? Yeah. So basically long story short, I am saying this all in backwards order. This is what happens when you interview someone with ADHD. You'll hear parts of a story in five different segments, all in varying orders. <laughs> That's good. But you know, uh, my therapist reframed routine as what's on the menu today. And it changed my life. I was so like, when I thought of the word routine, I just wanted to throw up. I can't do the same thing every day. That's why I work for myself because I need every day to be a unicorn, every day to be different, every day to be exciting. Otherwise I'm going to get burnt out and I'm not going to be motivated to do what I love. So as long as I do a little bit of writing every day, a little bit of art, uh, a little bit of movement and I schedule in my meals because sometimes when you get deep and hyper-focused, you can forget to eat or you can forget to move. Uh, and then, you know, I have meetings booked throughout the day from different people or workshops and 
I paint whenever I feel inspired. I paint intuitively. I don't schedule that into the day because you can't schedule inspiration. So, but as long as I get something done. That's interesting. I feel like, you know, as somebody who like, I like doing a lot of writing, like if I don't schedule that, it doesn't get done. Like if I don't say like, okay, cool for these next two hours, I'm going to, I'm going to stare at, you know, this, my notebook, or I'm going to start a writing application. Like it won't, nothing will happen. And I, I, I think the thing that I find really interesting about your, your spot. So like for people at home, like the, the awesome, did you call it your daily menu? Uh, yeah, I call it the, well, I also have it as a printable on my website too, but I sell a laminated version of it on my web, uh, sorry, at markets and stuff in person. But yeah, my ADHD daily menu. Yeah. And I just think that like, you know, uh, having worked in education for a long time, like I always, I just as somebody like, as how do I say this? I'd be in a professional development with like a hundred people and, you know, a bunch of teachers who like are really proud of the work that they've done and they're great teachers. Um, and I'm always the one who is like there. And when, you know, there's a frustration with like, oh, and this, this kid needs extra time on a test and it's so hard to schedule or whatever. I'm like, I was that kid. Like that was, that was me. I was the one who like had to have all that stuff. And we'd have people come in and, and demonstrate new skills to teach. And 99.999% of the time, when Whenever it's a, a student with ADHD will respond best to this type of practice. It's best for everybody. And I think that like your daily menu is a prime example of like, you know, routine is a scary word. And if you can get comfortable with the idea that, um, you know, like here's an alternative way to make a checklist instead of a never ending checklist, you've got a checklist that's scaffolded and compartmentalized all of a sudden you can find a new way to be productive and a new way to, to work within those spaces. So like, as you know, you, as somebody with ADHD, that's like, this works for me. Like I would argue that for most people, uh, rethinking your productivity based off of new ways to develop to-do lists is, is actually a beneficial activity. Yeah. I, I, that really resonated with me when you said I was that kid, because whenever I've been in teaching spaces, which I have been a lot, I've been a substitute teacher, I've been a preschool teacher, I've been a poetry teacher, an art teacher, a soccer coach. And I think a lot of times when I see my peers struggling, the teachers, I'm just sort of like, you got to see it from the kid's perspective. You got to see it from what, well, even if you aren't neurodivergent, what was it like when you were a kid? Would you like to hear what you're saying? Would you be excited? And whenever, you know, educators are complaining that the kids aren't listening and I'm like, well, are you entertaining them enough? Are you engaging enough? Are you excited enough? Because if you're looking like you're ha not having a fun time, they won't want to be there. And that that's that's how I get kids to listen. It's like uh, if I can be entertaining enough for them to be if I can be more entertaining than their side conversation than I've won. So, <laughs> yes. or like, yeah, just gauge their attention in some way, whether it's silly voices or movement or storytelling. Storytelling is a big one for me. Um, but yeah. Everybody wants to hear a story. And I think that if you can wrap, if you can wrap anything into a narrative, all of a sudden it becomes more approachable. Um, your, your comment, uh, I, I love quoting this, but uh, Steve Martin, the you know, uh, only murders in the building, right? He uh, he wrote a great book about a stand up career called Born Standing Up, and in it he has the quote, which is, uh, "Teaching is a performance art." You know, we need to acknowledge that. And I always think about that whenever I'm in front of the classroom, and people are like, "What? What was that?" And I'm like, "I don't know, but it worked. It was like the performance art that we needed to teach this specific skill today." Um, so going going back to your art career, I think that like what you know you have this this really great tiktok presence and in it uh i mean even just talking with you right now like i love the fact that like you you talk about masking and you're not afraid to unmask in front of anybody um and you know on your tiktok you you talk about the sort of like successes but also the woes of being an artist in 2023 like i was watching a video that you did about uh the actual cost to set up at an art show and the actual amount of money you made and the fact that like you know you, you, it is a risk and you took a loss, um, you know, on that, on that specific, that specific experience. But like for anybody who's out there, that's thinking about becoming their own boss or be becoming an artist who's selling online or doing art shows, like what sort of like tips or tricks do you, do you want to put out there for people that are, that are considering that shift? Be your most genuine self that 
being your most genuine self. If you are being fake in any way, shape or form, if you are not doing something that you feel comfortable with, say, for example, you're more introverted and you try to do markets and talk to people, you're not going to find success. Like you have to like, there's no cookie cutter way to be an artist. There's only a way to be yourself. And people buy art from the human, not because of what it looks like necessarily. Like they might like the colors and the way it looks, but art's expensive. And so people buy art based off of feeling and emotion more so than this would look nice in my home. I'm going to buy it. Uh, every single art piece that I've sold, at least in person, it's always been like they see, well, either they like my story in general, and then they pick one that they like, like visually speaking, or they learn about the piece and then they buy the piece because of its story. And as long as you can't, and it's back to that story, storytelling aspect, if, as long as you can tell a story about why you make what you make, if you're just making art to look pretty, you probably shouldn't be a full-time artist you've got to have some sort of deeper meaning of why you're doing it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be super emotional or anything. It could be you make art because you love to decorate rocks and you think that rocks um, are the pathway to not letting any paper fly away. And you had this one time when you were a kid that all of your papers flew away onto a highway and you couldn't do anything about it. So now you make rocks and no one will ever lose a piece of paper and always have a paperweight. Like it doesn't have to be that deep, but you got to have a story. And, um, I think that my, when I was in high school, I used to say that my art does not have meaning. I don't believe in meaning. I just believe in things looking cool because I would make super cool, psychedelic, large scale abstract paintings. I would make super high, hyper realistic portraits. And I'm like, it just looks cool, but that's because I was masking. And now I'm fully unmasked and my art sells and it makes sense now. So be your true self, tell your story. And if you like doing a certain thing, do it every day. I love it. I think your your comment about the story is really, really important. I mean, there's like in the fine arts world, you know, the reason a painting is worth $10 or $10 million very rarely actually has to do with the quality of the artwork. Um, it almost exclusively has to do with the narrative that is built behind that piece. Um, and if you're comfortable telling your own story, you're normally going to get other people enthusiastic about what you do, which will, I hate to belittle it to just this idea, but like that can and or will lead to sales. You know, like if people know that you're being genuine and you're being interesting and that your story is important to them, they connect with you. That is what makes people want to hang out in their homes. Like my entire mm -hmm. house is basically a museum. And I'm like, when, whenever anybody comes over, I'm so excited to be like, you want to hear about this piece? Cool. It's on cardboard. You want to know why it's on cardboard? And then I'll just like <laughs> go into this like whole narrative about it. And that leads it, it welcomes people into the art space it welcomes people into your work and it lets them know why it's important to you and then people see that enthusiasm and respond to it so i just i i want to applaud you for thinking about that storytelling component because i think that's oftentimes a lot of times when i like i talk with artists who are struggling or, or just business owners in general who are struggling like what is the story and it's like well i own a sub shop well if that's how you feel about it like I don't want to buy a sub. It's not made with love. It's not exciting. Um, but if you can, you can demonstrate that story, you can demonstrate that narrative. I think that people will, will respond to that. Yeah. And it's important too, for me to like, as well, make my art as visually stimulating as possible because my target audience is neurodivergence. People with ADHD may feel with autism. Like I want to create an environment where you can unmask whenever anyone walks into one of my tents at a juried art show um i've started to notice after like the past few months or the past year or so there's a certain vibe and a certain energy that walks close to my art there's maybe a hundred artists at these show at these shows like you can choose to walk into whatever tent you want but like it's either like they have a colorful personality or they have colorful hair or they have a colorful outfit on or they just, you know, they see, oh, you have ADHD, right? Like they, they sort of just like get this vibe. And then once they walk in, then I'm like, okay, time to be my most genuine self because they've let me in by walking in. And I was, I'm always like, I can either tell you the backstory behind a piece or you can look at a piece and come up with your own connection and be vulnerable with it. 
because sometimes people don't even like to hear the backstory. Sometimes they're like, oh, don't tell me. I, I want to figure it out myself. And then sometimes I play a guessing game. What do you want to know what it's really about? And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It really just depends on the person. But uh, I also wanted to note that when it comes to being a full-time artist, you're not going to rely on art sales for most of your income because people buying art is so random. And so, like, no matter how much you market it, like it's sometimes it takes like someone seven times of seeing the same painting to like actually want it. Um, that's what they say at least, but it's also about diversifying. So like I'm a part-time soccer coach and I'm a part-time babysitter and I do live painting and I do workshops and I do, you know, side gig, whatever opportunities I can find. I do commissions sometimes. Uh, do it all because some months are going to be better than others. So thanks for your honesty on that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, we, you talked about this idea of masking and I want to, um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to time travel with me for a second. So uh, here we are recording. Uh, we'll just, we'll, it, December has just started, but in reality, this, this is going live um, in, in early January. And I think that like, uh, you know, the new year is a time for a lot of people to, uh, you know, think about making significant changes to their lives. And everybody has their own new year. For mine, it's my birthday. Every year in August, I like reflect on my life in a way that I never have before. And I decide that's the time that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do inventory and kind of go from there. Um, but a lot of the things that people are focused on is, uh, you know, their own mental health and their own way to feel more comfortable in their own bodies and in their own minds. And you've had a really interesting journey to be able to get to that point of confidence and to that, that point of feeling as though like you're, you're special, your voice is worth hearing. Um, you know, like what are, what are some, I'm going to break it up into two, two points. And we'll start with the first one, which is like, what are some things you do for yourself um, to ensure that you are putting your, putting your mental health forward and you're putting your own, you know, uh, sort of support of your, your ADHD issues uh, forward. Like, what do you, what do you do personally? So since January of last year, I kind of made a vow to myself that I would cut out any person in my life that I wasn't able to be my most genuine self around, that I had to mask around. And so I lost some friends, lost some family members, but by doing that, well, first, first and foremost, my, my art career skyrocketed after because I was so much more focused. I wasn't having any mental blocks. Um, and also by doing that, you're only maintaining true genuine relationships in your life, people that love you and support you and for who you really are, not for who you are trying to be to please the other person. And as ADHDers, people pleasing is like a really, really tough thing because especially people pleasers who grew up in um, households of like emotional abuse, it's really hard to uh, unchange those habits. Uh, sorry, so it's really hard to change those habits of masking and acting a certain way in order to not make someone upset. Um, so once I sort of blocked out the negatives, and I always talk about with my art, um, my art does not have negative space because it's so busy, but it only has positive space. So only leaving, so blocking out the negatives and only leaving room for positive in your life. And it, yes, it can be very lonely, but I've learned, I actually have a piece called Being Alone that I made last year and I was only able, so I started it when I was feeling really sad and lonely. It was when one of my students got COVID and I had to stay at home for a week and I was just like not having it. Um, and I wasn't only, I was only able to finish that piece five months later when I was, when I quit a job that I wasn't supposed to be working and I ended a relationship I wasn't supposed to be in. And then I was super happy about my solitude and I was like independent. And it's about taking those relationships, only maintaining the positive ones and allowing yourself to turn that lonely factor into a solitude independence factor. And by doing that, people will start to enter your life that are good for you, that are healthy for you, and will support you. And it, you will feel lonely in moments, but it, I can tell you 100%, it's so much better of a feeling than masking for those people that weren't meant to be there. Um, that's how I maintain my mental health. That's how I maintain my sanity. Um, I can have days where I feel like I go a little cuckoo, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm an artist, so it's normal. 
I love it. And you answered that so succinctly that I don't have to ask my follow up. So I'm going to add another question in uh, before we before we wrap things up. But uh, the theme of soccer has come up a lot in this conversation. And soccer is obviously like a really important part of your life. Um, I'm a huge Ted Lasso fan, uh, not only for the soccer, but just for the good vibes. And I'm curious, like, what about uh, what about soccer has like called to you? And like, why do you love having soccer sort of be a part of of your, you know, annual occurrences? Yeah, so since I was a kid, art and soccer were my two favorite things. Um, you know, they talk about the the autism special interest as opposed to like the ADHD flipping from thing to thing. I have never been diagnosed with autism, but I have I've had a few friends that are that are like, maybe, but I've never been diagnosed, so I can't label myself as that. But at the same time, um, those are my special interests. Art and soccer always have been, always will. Uh I played other sports growing up. They just didn't hit the same. Uh, I, although I do have like a special love in my heart for theater, but I've in, incorporated that into my art by like doing live painting and stuff like that. But soccer, there's something about the team sport aspect of it. I've never had good hand-eye coordination when it comes to like activity besides art. I've had good foot-eye coordination. So don't put me in goalie, but I could play all the other positions. But back to like the social motivation thing when i have a team that's relying on me and i'm relying on them it it changes the idea of movement and it changes the idea of exercise uh and as i paint intuitively i also play intuitively like i actually i don't keep score whenever i play soccer i never keep score that's my thing like it affects my game i don't play to win i play because it's such a fun sport I don't even watch soccer because I get jealous of the people on TV. I'm like, oh, I want to go play. So I just, you know, I think COVID was really hard because I didn't have a team to play on because, you know, team sports were canceled. But I've been a soccer coach uh, for 13, no, going on 14 years. And I've been playing soccer since I was four years old, competitively since I was 12. And it's just something about it. It just, it, it's the dopamine. It increases the dopamine. And that's what every ADHD person wants is to have something that really makes your heartbeat just go up because you're having fun doing it. And, uh, you're moving. I don't know. I could go on and on. Soccer is so fun. <laughs> that's awesome. I it's, it's just always a fascinating sport to me because in the States, it's like the sport that like every kindergartner plays. Like it's like a legal requirement that like you are born, you know, you go through the traumas of that. And then eventually they'll put you on a soccer team and your parents will make a joke that you kicked a goal on the wrong goal. Like, it's just, that's like the inherent, like just American way. And then we just forget about soccer as a sport. So like the people who continue on with it or continue to be fans, like it truly is your lifeblood. Like it's truly with you forever. Um. So- yeah. Kyla, I really, I appreciate you being on the show. Um, I always want to make space just to uh, put out there, uh, you know, anything that maybe we haven't covered that you're interested in throwing out there, ideas that we haven't put out there. So um, what what's on your brain? What's something that you might want to, you know, tell the audience at home or talk about? Uh, the blank thing happened again. I know there's things I probably want to talk, but I guess... Generally speaking, if you live in the Toronto area or if you just live anywhere in the States or Canada, um, I do ship paintings, but I'm not asking you to buy my art. I'm asking you to engage with it online and to follow my art career. And then if whether it's in two months, two years or in 20 years, if you find something that you fall in love with and you can connect with on a deep level, um, I would love it if you supported my art. I don't tell people to buy my art because I know what it means to sell art and to buy art. And it means that you've made that emotional connection. So uh, I, I just ask you to uh, be vulnerable and connect with the work and uh, try to unmask as much as you can. And if you are an artist, try to create things a little more intuitively. Uh, it will truly help your artistic practice. Oh, I remembered a thing. Okay. Um, we touched on collaborations, I think, in the beginning. Something that has truly helped me find my personal like signature style is through collaborations, as opposed to just going to like art galleries of like hundred year old paintings and, you know, learning that way. Like, yes, I went through art school and did all that. But what truly refined my style was starting in like 2016, I would go to these parties in undergrad and I would meet other artists and I would book an art collab with them. And then we would just like 
swap papers and draw on top of each other's stuff. And now I teach that to kids and adults. And I have now have a creative partnership with uh, my friend Mirka. And we met at an art event last January and we've been art collabing ever since. And now we are uh, creative business partners and we're called Creatures on Instagram or creatures.to. Creatures was taken. Um, but we are creative, collaborative creatures. She's more illustrative. I'm more abstract. And then our styles mesh like peanut butter and jelly. We've done like live painting and we're starting an art collective together. Um, but our goal in the future is hopefully to, you know, just take what we're doing further and uh, inspire more people and make more art. So um, that is another thing. Collaborations are great. Great. And also I wanna... across, across disciplines too, like musicians, actors, anybody like hit me up if you want to collaborate. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's really important just like oftentimes, so we live in a world that is more connected than it ever has been. We can, we can reach out to anybody at any moment. And like, I can just speaking for myself, um, you know, like Kyla, there's a lot of people on the show that I know we've never met before right now. We're obviously going to be besties forever, but like we've never <laughs> met before this moment. And, um, you know, like I had seen something you posted and I knew my narrative and I knew what you had put forward. And I was like, I feel like this is somebody that would be worth talking to. And like I reached out and you said yes, you know, and I think that like uh, and I'll, I'll just say otherwise, like there's a, a New York Times bestselling author that I had uh, communicated with months ago, viewed it, just thought it was dead. Like, I'm never going to get this person on the show. And literally last night, they sent me an email back apologizing for the delay, like, and uh, telling me exactly when we would schedule an interview. Like these, you know, people inherently want to connect. People want to collaborate. And I think any part of ourselves that says, you know, I'm not sure I'm worthy of this collaboration or anything like that. Like, push that stuff down because if some if you reach out to somebody and they don't want to collaborate it's for one of two reasons either they're not worth your time or they're genuinely really busy and can't but they would love to do it and you'll never know if you don't you know make that connection uh, yeah. that was yeah, i that um, was i want to give a quick shout to musicians because pre covid i was collaborating with my friend who's a composer who i made a few album covers for but i did live painting to his band during a show I did live painting to him playing the organ and the piano and it was so fun. And then COVID happened and I'm just now starting to get back into live painting, like on stage with DJs. But um, if anyone is going on tour and wants to have a different kind of opening act or to have some sort of visual component on stage with their band, I am so down and I have a car and can meet you there. So <laughs> just let me know. <laughs> That's awesome. So speaking of that, um, once again, I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on the show. So if people want to uh, find you, uh, Kyla Yeager artwork, K-Y-L-A-Y-A-G-E-R-A-R-T-W-R-O-K.com. Um, where do they find you on uh, on social media? Yep. So if you're on TikTok, I am Kyla Yeager artwork on TikTok, same as my website. And if you want to find me on Instagram, I'm artby.kylay. So A-R-T-B-Y dot K-Y-L-A-Y. I made that name like eight years ago and I'm too scared to change it because I'm afraid that people won't know who I am anymore on Instagram. So they're they're both different. Um, and then, yeah, so the website, Instagram is TikTok where, is where I mostly post. You'll find me other places, but they're not as active. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Kyla, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Kyla. What an absolute pleasant person. And uh, I really liked ending about collaboration because I think it's important that you realize that everybody wants to do something cool with you. So if you've got a creative project in your brain, talk about it. Try to find people who want to uh, to join you and, and see what happens. This show wouldn't exist without the collaboration of my amazing guests. So, Kyla, thanks so much for coming on and having that wonderful conversation about uh, intuitive art. If you enjoyed that episode or you know somebody who uh, may benefit from hearing it, please share, share, share. Write a review. Give it to somebody who you think uh, may identify with the ADHD narrative. Post it to your own social media feeds. Uh, or just come and uh, send me an email, meditations at ryanslomek.com to let me know how this episode impacted you. Or follow me on social media, the world of Ryan Slomek. It's also where you can hear about upcoming episodes. And let me tell you, on January 17th, we have a really fun one. 
It requires a little bit of history, though. If you're unfamiliar with the history of uh, home filmmaking, Kodak invented the Super 8 millimeter form uh, in the 1960s, and it was sort of the first home video. Well, it's a form that people thought would die out, but still, here we are in 2024, and it's still very popular among independent independent filmmakers, uh, music video directors, and it's used in major motion pictures and television shows the world around. So uh, the prime place to get your uh, Super 8 millimeter film either to shoot with or to get it uh, per, like produced and scanned uh, is a place called Pro 8 Millimeter, and we're going to be meeting with the president of Pro 8 Millimeter, Phil Vigent. Phil is an inventor, he's a businessman, he's a person with a really interesting history who, once again, loves collaborating, and we're going to talk about uh, just sort of the history of Super 8, history of his experience in business, and then talk about kind of the culture of Super 8 in movie making in 2024. So if you like that, please tune in for episode 13 on January 17th, where you can find all of your podcasts. With that, go make something. I dare you. Be creative. It's a good year for it. Can't wait to hear what you make. Have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful start to your 2024, and I will catch you in two weeks. 